Hello everyone, my name is Martin and I would like to welcome you to the Herzogenaurach in Germany. We are at the Adidas uh, headquarters, the world headquarters with Matt Powell. I would like to welcome you here. Matt. Thank you, great Thank to you. be here. Thank you very much for the opportunity uh, for an interview. Uh, Matt Powell is the Vice President and Senior Industry Advisor for the NPD Group, if I'm not That's mistaken. Uh, you cover the sports, outdoor and recreation marketplace. You have 40 plus years of experience in the retail market and advising one of the biggest or the biggest companies in the industry. Yes. Uh, and you are recognized as the expert and the go-to source uh, pretty much of the analysis or, or that, that kind of stuff. Yeah, thank you. So my first question is, uh, you have been mapping the sneaker culture for many years. Uh, there have been many trends that have come by and pretty much stayed for a long time. Uh, which trends do you think are the main ones or the main defining ones for the sneaker culture and the industry itself, if you can? Well, I think it's interesting that when you go back to 40 years ago when the sneaker business started, we actually saw trends that lasted a decade long. Mm -hmm. um, and what's happened today is that the cycles are moving much faster the uh, changes are much more volatile today than mm -hmm. they've ever been. Uh, and so that, I would say that really marks the current uh, state of the industry is that, that uh, trends are happening much more quickly uh, mm -hmm. and, and much more volatilely. I think that you know, the running shoe business has really been um, uh, probably the trend that has lasted the longest. It mm -hmm. really began in the 70s um, and has carried over to today. Um, and I think one of the other things I'd point out is that we moved from a period where people were actually using athletic footwear for what it was intended, mm -hmm. playing basketball in a basketball shoe, running in a running shoe, and today most sneakers in the U.S. are, are worn for casual wear, mm -hmm. uh, even though they have a, a grounding in a performance. Okay, so you think that uh, the original sportswear shifted into the lifestyle category? That's absolutely correct, yes. Okay, okay. And do you think there were any trends that uh, pretty much were harmful for the industry more than pretty much shifting it into the right uh, right direction. Harmful? Yeah. How do you mean? Uh, I don't know if, if there were any, let's say, things that uh, the mainstream community uh, was seeing as, as uh, not good or whatever. No, I don't think so. I mean, I think we've had one trend that was around in the 90s was the cross training trend. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really never come back as a, as a story. But I don't know that I call it harmful. I think mm -hmm. it just was was a trend that played itself out. Um, you know, I think socially we, we've seen with limited edition shoes, there have been instances of, of robberies and violence mm -hmm. against uh, people who had a shoe, but those have really been isolated incidents for mm -hmm. the most part. So, no, I don't think I would say anything that's been harmful. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so in 2014, according to an interview with you, uh, the biggest sneaker segment was, as you said, running. Uh, is it still the same? Is sportswear still the biggest segment or the biggest uh, part of the industry or is it shifting somewhere else? No, sportswear continues to be the largest part of the industry. And again, many of the sportswear shoes were rooted in, in uh, performance. Um, a big component of the sportswear business today is, is our Jordan retro shoes mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, that Michael Jordan actually played in. Um, uh, but those shoes are not used for basketball any longer. Um, and now we've seen a whole uh, category of footwear. You think of Nike Tangent, uh, Adidas uh, NMD, Tubular Shadow, shoes that really have no grounding in sport at all um, have become very important in the, in, in the footwear market. So that's been a, a recent change where we've seen shoes that really had no uh, foundation and performance uh, being very important to the sportswear market. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, last year or for the past few months there is a trend called ugly, ugly mm -hmm. shoes. The yep, ugly, dad shoes. Yeah, dad shoes. Ugly is the new pretty pretty much. Uh, do you think that it is a trend that will last longer or is it just a really short-term thing for the this year, let's say, and it will just move to a different, different, different thing. I think it really is going to depend on, on how much the consumer really accepts it. Certainly, we've seen a, a, a fair amount of uh, the the real luxury designer brands mm -hmm. have been using this uh, this look, um, and it really hasn't 
gained much in terms of volume. Mm -hmm. um, so my gut is it probably doesn't last very long. Um, but if, for, for instance, Fila has a shoe called the Disruptor mm -hmm. um, that has, has started to show some signs of being actually commercial in quantities. So if that shoe and other shoes pick up, it potentially could last a, a, a longer time. But uh, again, most of the trends we're seeing are really lasting a, a relatively short period of time. And mm -hmm. uh, that's a change for the industry. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you think there were any trends uh, similar to the dead shoe that were uh, used more by the luxury brands than the streetwear scene, let's say? Or pretty much something similar uh, to the... This trend. Well, I think the only, the other place where we've seen luxury brands <coughs> interpret the sneaker market has been around some of the really iconic styles like Chuck Taylor, mm -hmm. Air Force One. Um, those shoes are relatively easy to make. Uh, mm -hmm. They don't have a lot of componentry to them. They're, they're simple designs. And so that's been a place where we've seen the luxury brands take that base and, and expand on it. Um, and that would be the other place besides this dad shoe mm -hmm. story, I think, that mm -hmm. we've seen luxury really enter the uh, sneaker place space. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Uh, do you have any predictions about what's uh, next to come in terms of trends? Do you think there are going to be any any new trends emerging in the in the few months, let's say, coming? Well, here's an interesting thought. I think that we we've talked about this in many presentations that. Today, I think the trends really begin with the consumer, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to beginning with a brand or, or with a designer. Uh, the consumer is, is the one who says this is the next new thing. Um, and uh, uh, you know, we're, for instance, we're seeing a resurgence in Air Force One right now as a, as a story. Um, the, the what I would call the modern runner look NMD. Uh, think about that as a modern runner look. Seems like it's playing itself out. Um, uh, but it's the origins of trends are not nearly as obvious as they used to be when it was started by a brand or by a designer. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really coming from the street today, from the consumer, and uh, so it's a little harder to read what's what's mm -hmm. going to be next. Okay, okay, perfect. We talked about the the consumer and the and the street or the streets, uh, which uh, directly connects connects to reselling and the resale industry. And what, what do you think about the industry itself? Uh, it has gained uh, a lot of hype and popularity in the, few, uh, in the past few years. And uh, millennials are using this, this, uh, this, let's say, industry to flip shoes and make a little bit more money, probably to buy more clothes, uh, which, uh, which connects with the term hype beast. Uh, what, is your, what is your thought about this whole industry? I think that the resale market used to be based on true fans of a product trading those products with other true fans. Mm -hmm. um, and it was relatively small, it was somewhat underground. Um, most of it was done in person, face to face, uh, uh, at conferences, at meetings, that kind of thing. Uh, and over the last five years or so, um, uh, the internet has entered into the space and, and this whole group of flippers have come in and as intermediaries. <clears throat> what I think has happened is the true fan now has to pay a lot more money than they used to for the products that they covet. Um, we have people profiteering on that. Um, there have been now uh, websites, StockX, Goat, etc., that have come along um, and um, are, are uh, formalizing um, these relationships and and guaranteeing that the product is authentic and so I think that's been a, that's been a good thing but at the end of the day I think the the true fan is now got barriers layers between themselves and the products that yeah, they yeah, want they're exactly. having to pay more money so exactly. I, I, at the end of the day I would say I think it's probably been not a good thing mm -hmm. uh, for the true fan uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, but now brands and retailers are saying how do I get a piece of this how do I interface with this um, I also think that the resale market has turned out not to be as big as everybody thought it was going mm -hmm. to be. It's certainly a substantial market, but I would estimate the resale market to be about a billion dollars in the U.S. Last year in the U.S. we sold $39 billion worth of shoes um, at retail. So a billion dollars, and that's at the resold price, oh, not, yeah. not at the initial price, yeah. uh, is a very, fairly small slice of the overall marketplace. Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, it was uh, inevitable to, to the, uh, for the uh, resale market to uh, pretty much grow this much? Or 
Yeah, I th again, I think the internet made it easy to trade here, and, and so all of a sudden now the trading became much more, um, uh, it was simpler and, and uh, uh, more people could get involved in it, and, and I think people are always looking for a way to make a, another a quick buck, and, uh, mm -hmm. and so that's a part of this as well. Mm -hmm. So the resell, or reselling itself has gone from hand-to-hand -hand trading uh, to eBay, Craigslist, uh, now Facebook, uh, lately, a lot of uh, sites like StockX or Goat have been emerging, as well as the the stores, pretty much. Uh, do you think there is uh, another milestone for the uh, for the resale industry, or is this is it on its peak, pretty much, right now? Well, I think what's going to be interesting is whether we see conventional retailers and conventional brands start to insert themselves into the process. And brands are saying to me, you know, hey, I sell a shoe for $200, it's reselling for $600 hours later, maybe I should be charging $400 for that shoe and getting a piece of, a piece of that business. I think also we're going to start to see brands um, via their company apps, their loyalty apps, um, control who gets the shoes initially. Um, and I think they're going to try to make sure that the fans get the shoes initially as opposed to the flippers who've used a bot or some other, some other trick to, uh, to, to, get a, uh, to get access to the shoes. So I think that will change the dynamic of what's mm -hmm. happening out there. And I think it, at the end of the day, the valuations on these shoes are really set by how many pairs are made. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen sample shoes, one of one, being sold for frightening amounts of money. Um, player shoes, shoes that Michael actually played in as an example, being sold for, for uh, massive amounts of money. Um, I expect that we'll, the brands will, will continue to make greater and greater numbers of these mm -hmm. limited edition shoes, which will su suppress the, uh, the resale value because mm -hmm. there'll be more pairs in the marketplace. So do you think it's better for the companies to uh, higher the initial price or just make the volumes bigger? What do you think is the... You know, I, I think it's dangerous for the brands to to charge more than the shoes are really worth. I think that starts to exploit their consumers mm -hmm. again. So my gut is that what we'll see is greater pairs out there, not not uh, higher prices. Mm -hmm. So which is pretty much good for the for the true fans. Yes, exactly. Perfect. Perfect. So we spoke about reselling and the term high beast, which has gained a very negative connotation in the past few months. Uh, do you think it's a natural development for the true fans to pretty much use this term in the in the let's say negative way or does it help to spread the culture in the mainstream medias or or like the mainstream well i think i think the real fan is, it feels exploited by the flippers and so they're putting pejorative names on them because it, they're costing them more money to get the products that they want um, i think it's a natural outgrowth of the fact that people are making money here and mm -hmm. but i think Again, we sort of lost the perspective of the industry, and it's much more about how much can I make on this shoe, what's the, what's the shoe going to sell for, uh, as opposed to the intrinsic value of the shoe. I would argue that some of the limited edition products that are being made today aren't, are, are not particularly attractive, are, uh, don't really add much to the culture, um, but they're getting a lot of attention because they're selling for great multiples of the, mm -hmm. uh, of the initial price. Mm -hmm. So I was looking through your Twitter, and I've noticed that you quite regularly react to uh, tweets of the so-called high beast, let's yes. say. Uh, and you are reacting to all sorts of questions regarding uh, the hype trends or items or whatever. Uh, is it a routine or do you enjoy stating the facts and the numbers to these people? You know, I, I like to think that my role on Twitter is to teach. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm an old guy, so I'm, I'm thinking about teaching. And so uh, I, I hope I'm helping people understand the business behind the business. I think that's why people follow me on Twitter, um, is because I help them understand the dynamic of what happens in the shoe market and what's it take to make a shoe and, uh, and to bring a, a product to marketplace. Um, uh, and I do like to correct people who are wrong. Uh, uh, I, I don't hesitate to do that. So, um, but I spend far too much time on Twitter. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I think that's fine. Thank uh, you. Are there cases where the people that you react to 
uh, say that they were wrong or do they agree that they were mistaken or just state their opinions all around? Well, I think there are some people out there who say, gee, I didn't know that or I appreciate your perspective. Um, uh, and, and then there are other ones who just want to state their their love for an, uh, a celebrity or their love for a brand and really are blind. Um, and then I think there are others out there uh, who, who maybe misinterpreted some of the things that I said. I mentioned, for instance, that in January, um, uh, Adidas in the U.S. sold significantly more product than Jordan did. And I got a real pushback from a lot of flippers, I think, um, um, who uh, made some money selling Jordan um, because the shoes were more limited mm -hmm. in quantity, which is why they did less sales, um, and pushed back that I was wrong, uh, that, that uh, Adidas uh, 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 sold much more than, than Jordan, uh, but I think they misinterpreted what I was saying mm -hmm. or, or tried to interpret it in their way. Right. So, um, I, again, I do I, I do like to think that I'm actually helping people understand the business better, and I think some people do appreciate that. And then I get other people who just want to tell me I'm wrong. Oh, yeah, that, that's classic, I guess. So as we uh, as we've just spoken about the the uh, let's say famous names, artists, and whatever. Do you think that these people help the, the brands to push the products or is it just about the design itself? Well, I think that, um, look, I think that artists bring attention to, to a brand. Um, we certainly saw with uh, when Puma signed Rihanna, the, the, uh, the immediate impact to, the, to their business. Um, but I also would tell you, and I say this about athletic celebrities as well, LeBron and, and Curry and so forth, um, I don't think any of them earn in merchandise sales uh, what they're being paid. Um, so do, does a, a particular artist bring attention to a brand? Um, yes, but to a limited number of people. And I would argue that the majority of sneaker shoppers in, a, in America and around the world don't know that so-and-so is involved with, with a particular brand. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's important to remember that, for instance, last year Adidas sold 400 million pairs of shoes. Uh, Nike sold a similar number of pairs of shoes. Um, most of these celebrity uh, associated products are made in the tens of thousands of pairs. Mm -hmm. So tens of thousands out of 400 million, yeah, uh, not much of an impact there. Uh, okay, and um, I've been following sneakers for the past few years. But to me, it seems that the sneaker culture itself is pretty much on its peak right now. Uh, all the, let's say, mainstream medias are catching uh, with the hype, talking about sneakers, about the culture. Do you think it's a natural development or uh, somehow the mainstream celebrities help to push it that way? Well, I think we're actually in an interesting period now where what I'm calling rent a celebrity, uh, paying a celebrity to uh, to endorse your product is starting to play itself out. And again, I would include the athlete endorsers here as well. Uh, LeBron sales, for instance, are substantially lower today than they were three years mm -hmm. ago. And yet LeBron is making the same amount of money mm -hmm. that he was making back then. Um, I think what's going to be really interesting is to start to, to, to see micro-influencers becoming into the marketplace. And uh, NPD measures about 20 different industries across the world, not just sport. Um, one of the industries we measure is beauty, the beauty industry. Mm -hmm. and, and makeup and fragrances are really being driven today by micro-influencers, people who are, are developing a small little brand, selling it online, um, and, and getting a, a huge following. Uh, um, we're starting to see more brands and footwear even come out with only footwear uh, sold online. So brands like Greats or, or Allbirds or uh, Mahabas. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that, that th those brands driven by micro-influencers could be the next big thing that we're going to see. Okay, so we're going to start seeing more of the smaller influencers to, let's say, exactly. more smaller influencers for the bigger brands uh, rather than one huge one that will... Exactly. Okay. And, and probably influencers that are not compensated. Mm -hmm. or compensated in big money. Oh, yeah. uh, they might get sample shoes, they might get a, per a perk or two here or mm -hmm. there, but they're not making millions of dollars like, like some of the athletes and celebrities So are. it's even a better deal for the brands itself? Correct. Okay. And I think more, more authentic is uh -huh. really the key here though. I, I think that the consumer has figured out, understands that 
um, so and so is getting paid a lot of money to endorse a certain brand. Um, uh, Drake is an example, and not to not to pick on him, but but as an example that you know lots of conversation he's moving from from Nike Jordan oh, yeah, yeah, to yeah, yeah. to Audi, and um, and why money. Uh, is, you know, what, why did Durant think about going to Under Armour and then ultimately signing back with Nike? Money. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't begrudge anybody making money in what they do. That's, uh, I like to make as much money as I can doing what I do as well. Um, but uh, I, I think the consumer is starting to figure out that this person is wearing this brand because they're paid to, not because they really love that brand. And if you go back into some of the early days of celebrity influence in mm -hmm. sneakers, it was all about the uh, the endorser, the celebrity saying, I wore that brand when I was a kid, I came oh, yeah. up wearing this brand and that's why I'm wearing it not, mm -hmm. and not because I'm getting paid. So you think that it's more about money rather than the options to design their own shoes? Yes. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think that I think the uh, the design thing has gotten a little bit overblown. I mean, f fact of life, athletes and celebrities aren't shoe designers. Oh, yeah. They may go in and express their preference. I like this color. I like this design. I remember wearing this as a kid. Um, but th they don't know how to build a shoe. Uh, mm -hmm. Building a shoe is very difficult. And um, you know, one of the things that I push back on a lot are people who try to give celebrities credit for a brand's turning around or not. And I, I say to that that really disrespects the hundreds and hundreds of people who are working very hard every day to really build a shoe, mm -hmm. to make a shoe, to design it, have it f function, have it made in Asia, all the parts that go together to, to make a shoe successful. Um, and to say, so-and-so uh, designed this shoe in an afternoon, that doesn't happen. So you think that's a, that is uh, a common misinterpretation, uh, yes. pretty much, that uh, the brands give the influencers a lot of, let's say, uh, space, yes. but actually they don't and people think that the influencers pretty much push the brands and that's where the misinterpretation like uh, emerges from. Exactly. I think the celebrity influencers are asked their opinion about shoes and do you like pink or green? Do you mm -hmm. want a unicorn on the shoe? Whatever the, whatever the story might be. Um, but it's up to real designers and mm -hmm. real shoemakers, real shoe builders to, to put that product together. Mm, okay. <clears throat> I think that we both can agree that Adidas and Nike are the top protagonists of the industry right now. Do you think there is a chance for another brand to emerge and compete with them on the same level? I actually do. I think um, we see brands like Under Armour, who came out of nowhere uh, 20 years ago um, and have built built into a multi-billion dollar company, uh, a brand like Skechers, uh, mm -hmm. who many don't consider uh, a, a legit sneaker brand, but here's another brand that's built into several, several billion dollars. Um, uh, it's not easy. Um, uh, you have to be very well capitalized. You have to be very well thought out. Um, there are many brands that make an introduction and then just can't get through the next level and the next level to get there. Um, but potentially, yes, I, I think that there could be a, another competitor to Adidas or Nike on the horizon. Mm -hmm. uh, both Skechers and, uh, and uh, Saucony, is that? Are American brands, if yes. I'm not mistaken? Do you think there is a European brand that could potentially, like, catch catch up with you? I do, I I'm not saying no, there isn't one, but I ca I can't think of one that's out there okay. um, uh, that that I would call up as uh, ha having that potential. But uh, sure, I don't think it matters what country the idea comes from. It could be China. Okay. Um, you know, China is going to China is going to be the largest sneaker market in the world in a number of few few years now mm -hmm. coming up, and uh, they're already the second largest sneaker mm -hmm. country in the world, four times the population of the U.S., so it's very logical to mm -hmm. understand that they're going to be uh, the largest sneaker market in the world, and, and could, could uh, a brand emerge in China as an example and, and, uh, and, and, and become a, a competitor? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. In the last two or three years, we've seen that Adidas has uh, grown a lot. Uh, what do you think is the 
is the fuel for the for this growth. What do you think that? That's um, that? I'm a product guy. I come I come from a, re a retail background, so I think it's always about product. Mm -hmm. um, in in 2013, when Adidas was really in in, uh, in dire straits in the U.S., the market share continued to sink. <clears throat> they made a decision to move 200 people from here in Herzo to Portland, Oregon, mm -hmm. and they said to those people, figure out what the kid in America wants to buy and make those shoes for him. Mm -hmm. And what came out of that NMD uh, 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 tubular shadow is, is two, two big examples. They took Boost and moved it from a performance shoe into a lifestyle shoe. They took a shoe that was working here in Euro Europe, ZX Flux, and brought that mm -hmm. over to the U.S. and got that going. Um, and uh, and so it really, to me, it really it was all about product. Um, uh, I think that if you don't have the product, the greatest endorser, the greatest marketing campaign in the world is not going to be successful. Mm -hmm. The product has to be right for and then the marketing pushes uh -huh. it further. Um, and uh, so I give credit to those 200 people that uh, moved over uh -huh. to, uh, to okay. the US and really helped fuel this. Mm -hmm. So it's always about design, Correct. design of the shoe itself. Correct, that would be my view. Okay, so Nike came back or came back last year by the end of the year with the uh, Off-White collaboration, pretty much stormed the world with it. Uh, how big of an influence uh, are the currently big collaborations of these brands? Do you think that it can be pushed even further uh, for the, let's say, even uh, bigger brands like, I don't know, Balenciaga, Gucci and all this stuff? Or uh, or is there uh, a different way to go now for the... Well, I think it's really important to understand that most collaborations are not commercial in terms of the number of pairs that mm -hmm. are made. Um, most of you, you take a, de a designer brand like Balenciaga, they're making less than 10,000 pairs, perhaps even less than mm -hmm. 5,000 pairs of those shoes. Okay. And part of the reason they're desirable is because there's only 5,000 pairs mm -hmm. of them. Uh, Off-White was the same kind of scenario. One of the things that I'm talking to brands about though is how do they figure out how to commercialize uh, a collaboration mm -hmm. like that? Um, uh, uh, oftentimes, it, I talked to a brand the other day that told me that they made more samples of a collaboration than they actually ended up making pairs. Okay, you're not making any money doing that. Okay, oh, yeah. so so it's like how do you take and Puma? I think has really done an interesting job of this with with what they've learned from Rihanna and, and from Kylie and and, uh, and Selena is that they they're taking Cara Delevingne, they're taking elements of those shoes and putting them in commercial shoes. So you have basket heart with a big bow on it, and all of a sudden they're doing more shoes with bows. Mm -hmm. They took, you had Fenty with the high sidewall, oh, yeah, yeah. they're doing more high sidewall shoes uh -huh. in the commercial line. Um, and I think this is where brands can benefit from the collaboration. If all they're doing is making 500 pair for a store, uh, 5,000 pairs for a, uh, a particular celebrity, nobody's making money on that. Mm -hmm. So how do you take that and make 50,000 pairs? Oh, yeah. 500,000 pairs and that's where the money is mm -hmm. and brands are I think beginning to really understand the commercial opportunity of interpreting a portion not the exact shoe that mm -hmm. uh, Off-White made but take elements of that shoe and put it into commercial products. Mm -hmm. Is it even possible to make a worldwide collaboration that will hit the mainstream I don't, I don't think so, but I think you can take elements of a collaboration yeah. and make that into mainstream. Mm -hmm. I, I'll give you an example. When, when, when Kanye West was still with, with Nike uh, and they did the Red October, Nike brought out several iterations of all red shoes. Mm -hmm. They called them different names. They weren't Red October, uh -huh. it was Solar Red. And, oh, yeah. uh, and, and I, that was an idea here that I'm talking about, saying, okay, we had all this attention on a very small number of pairs, 5,000, 10,000 pairs of Red Octobers that were made. Now let's go over here and make tens of thousands of pairs of other red shoes that those people who knew about this would understand that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and that's again how you commercialize this product. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I know you're uh, a big Yeezy skeptic, let's say. Uh, I'm a skeptic about a lot of things, but that's alright. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, do you think there is a potential to uh, reform this uh, Yeezy Boost to be le like the next Roshi run or whatever, or is the price set too high? 
I think the price is too high. The, the question is how do you take that and interpret it down mm -hmm. into a uh, uh, more of a volume price point um, product. Um, but I think you have to be really careful here. I, I, I wrote a blog about um, um, remembering what happened with Reebok when, when they did the original Jay-Z S. Doc Carter mm -hmm. shoe. Um, and I was in Sneaker Villa in uh, North Broad Street in Philadelphia mm -hmm. the day that shoe broke and saw the crowds and the excitement around, mm -hmm. around that product. And um, yeah, you know, Reebok made 500 pairs for that. Uh, that worked out well, so they said, let's make 5,000 pairs, and that sold out. And then they said, let's make 50,000 pairs, and that sold out. Then they said, let's make 500,000 pairs, and they ended up at TJ Maxx. Oh, yeah. Um, so it, it, every shoe has a finite amount of, mm -hmm. of, of what the marketplace can digest. And again, so much of what makes these collaborations desirable is not the shoe itself, um, I look at a shoe like Calabasas and say, how is that, how is that special, okay? That's a Reebok workout warmed yeah. over. Um, uh, um, but what made it special was there were only X number of pairs that were mm -hmm. made. Now you make this many pairs, no one's going to want them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think that if everybody could get a Yeezy as he promised was going to happen, nobody is going to want one. Um, so uh, I, I, I think the whole strength of what makes collaborations work is that they're limited uh, mm -hmm. as opposed to really commercial. Okay. Uh, what do you think is the core difference between Nike and Adidas? I think uh, everyone, everybody can differentiate between uh, the two brands pretty much by the design itself. But what do you think is the the main difference uh, in terms of business uh, or strategy or whatever? Well, probably the biggest thing is is this trend that we've seen moving to sport lifestyle um, mm -hmm. and away from performance. And um, I think Adidas is really focused on um, on the sports lifestyle piece of the business. They certainly have elements of sport, uh, and they still make very credible sport shoes. Um, but the real strength of where of the brand today is around sports lifestyle. I think Nike is still trying to force performance on the marketplace, um, and we see this spring uh, Vapor Max Max Two Seventy. Uh, Epic React um, are really performance shoes um, and we'll see whether the consumer gravitates to that mm -hmm. or not. Um, as I said earlier, I think that, that the consumer is driving trend today, not the brand. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the brand's job is to recognize trend and to feed the trend um, and uh, I think Adidas is doing a much better job of that today. Mm -hmm. uh, talking about performance, we've seen uh, both, uh, both Adidas and Nike developing new new technologies, for example the Futurecraft 4D for Adidas or the self-lacing shoes for, for Nike. Do you think that these, uh, these technologies will be the standard in the future or will they be still something as limited as it is right now? Based on what we know today, I think um, both of them are going to be limited. Um, I think Future Craft probably has more of an opportunity to be commercial. Mm -hmm. um, uh, as you get to scale, um, I think that we'll see the cost come down, as we saw with with Prime Knit and, and Fly Knit. Um, one, the initial shoes were very expensive, and as as they got to be more commercial, they were able to drive the cost down. But just, but they're still expensive shoes. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't think we'll see a Future Craft shoe at forty nine ninety nine oh, yeah. uh, uh, at retail. But I do think it will come down uh, in mm -hmm. price as they get to scale. Um, you know, I think the um, uh, the Air Mags were much more about really developing a truly adaptable shoe. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Mark Parker has talked about um, a shoe that knows when your foot's too hot or when you're getting a blister or uh, when you change terrain that you're uh, that you're running on. Um, and I think that that's the grand dream of, of what that shoe can ultimately be. Um, we're a long way from that being commercial. Mm -hmm. So it's still about sports pushing these technologies to their boundaries or or do you think it's uh, it's more coming from the lifestyle let's say segment that uh, it's developing this way probably sports way well, I think that, that the consumer is expecting performance characteristics in everything that they buy today, mm -hmm. whether it's a, a shirt that has antimicrobial or a pair mm -hmm. of jeans that feel like yoga pants. Um, I, you know, I think there is a, there, there's an understanding that there are technologies out there that make the products that I wear more comfortable or function better. And so I think the consumer still wants those things in the products that they buy, uh, but I don't know that they're necessarily using them for the full intended purpose. Um, we asked our customers uh, in the NPD data 
Um, they bought a pair of sports shoes. What do you intend to do with them? Um, in 2013, 25% of the people who bought a sports shoe said they intended to do sport. Last year, only 18% of the people who bought a sports shoe said they intended to do sport in, in those shoes. So footwear, even though it has performance characteristics, um, is still being used primarily for casual wear. Mm -hmm. So I think the consumer likes to know that they have performance characteristics, um, even though they don't really intend to use them for that purpose. Mm -hmm. okay. I know you don't wear sneakers pretty much, but uh, is there like a favorite model or uh, a favorite shoe of yours? It can be business-wise, design-wise, whatever. My son's 30 years old. Uh, his first pair of real basketball shoes were the original questions. Mm -hmm. um, so whenever I see that shoe, I always smile. It makes me think of uh, him when he was 10 years old and, okay. uh, and playing ball. Uh, so maybe that's the closest thing I have to a favorite mm -hmm. shoe. Okay, thank you. And, <clears throat> and the last question, what is the most memorable thing you have uh, from the from this industry let's say it can be an event or uh, something I don't know meeting a famous famous person well um, my last retail job was working for a dot-com that was started by John Elway Michael Jordan and Wayne Gretzky mm -hmm. uh, and I got to work with those three guys um, mm -hmm. and so I would say that was one of the most memorable times in my career was to, to have an association with three world-class athletes uh, uh, who had a dream of a website to help kids play sports better mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't about selling more Jordan product or, or other endorsed product it was John and it was John Elway's original idea and his idea was he wanted to create a website that taught kids how to throw a football how, he wanted to show kids how to do a crossover dribble um, and uh, um, and the idea was was right we were probably early for the time but uh, uh, getting to, to meet and, and not just meet but work with those athletes mm -hmm. was uh, one that's of the coolest awesome. things that ever happened to me okay that's that's pretty much it for me thank you very much do you have any any last uh, words for the for the audience well, I think, you know, sneaker culture is great, wonderful. I, I, I'm a great student of, of the business. Um, uh, I think a lot of great things have happened over the years. And um, I, there are some unfortunate things like the, the insertion of flippers in the marketplace that are really presenting the, uh, preventing the, the uh, a true fan from getting to the product. But, uh, um, you know, I think sneaker culture is here to stay. Um, I think the athleisure trend is here to stay. And, um, uh, I think there are great opportunities for young people who are interested in the industry to get involved in, in, in the business as well. Um, I offer, uh, offer anyone who follows me on Twitter if they have a question about a school project uh, that involves sneaker brands, I'm, I'm very happy to talk about that. So um, I'm excited to, to try to pass on what I've learned and, uh, uh, and to see the industry grow. Perfect. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you.